Uh, my name's Andrew Stuck. I'm one of the three people who uh, have uh, put together the Walk, Listen, Create platform, and uh, we host uh, Sound Walk September, uh, which, guess what, takes place in September. And there's an open call out at the moment, so if you're making pieces of work, uh, please do submit them for Sound Walk September. And I think what we're going to do is say, uh, welcome, Jeff and Mike. And I'm going to hand over to Jeff to introduce himself, and we'll get going. Uh, well, hello, folks. However many people are there, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to talk for 10 minutes about my work. I'm going to focus on uh, just a couple of items and the stories behind them, because I think it throws up various issues about my work in practice and it keeps it sort of more engaging than being a, a full-blown talk. Um, so my life in a nutshell as regards walking and sound. I could subtitle it Legger, from Legger to Arsa. I don't know if people know these terms. Uh, it's bird watchers are thought to be belong to one of two camps. Leggers are arses. Leggers, as it implies, go laying off chasing birds, whereas arses sit there and let birds come to them. Now, you might think that leggers, well, they do get to see lots more birds, but the problem is that they drive a, a wave, a kind of surge of disturbance before them. So they see birds at a distance, whereas the arse sitting there, letting the birds come to him, has a much more intimate experience and the birds behave naturally. So part one, quantity. I used to be a proper walker. Ever since childhood, my grandfather used to take me out on nature walks. Every weekend and during the evening if after school, we'd go along the river and or down, down the beach. And then when I was about 10, he moved to the Scottish Highlands. And uh, I used to get up there as often as I could to the east side of the Cairngorms there. And I became a proper walker because during my teens and 20s, I kind of got this fascination for golden eagles. Now, seeing golden eagles at that point involved, wow, striding out over those hills to far horizons. So indeed, a proper walker. Golden eagles got me into ecology because it puzzled me that I knew a couple of pairs around where my granda lives, but there was these big gaps. They have a range of about 25. Uh, square miles, but there were, there were areas where it felt like there should be eagles and there weren't. And so I started to really think about this, you know, well, is it something in the food chain? Reading about soil, uh, insulation, exposure to the weather and all sorts of stuff and got, got very interested in ecology. The irony, of course, was that I found out it was nothing to do with ecology. It was down to human persecution. They were getting killed off on the grouse moors that, uh, of certain areas. But that got, it got me going on ecology. And something that happened, yeah, it would be about the mid 1980s um, and going up for our summer week. At the, <coughs> the end of May, good time for watching eagles. Um, we headed off for our living in London, headed off, called in my mother's in Northumberland for the evening, and then left about a bit after midnight to be entering the Highlands at dawn. And I was going to go off for a walk up this valley to the Glen to, to an eagle spot that I knew. And halfway up there, I sat down, birchwoods. I'd sit, in, in winter, I'd, I'd, I'd become aware of how dead they were, these beautiful birchwoods around uh, Tom and Tow. And no, we weren't completely dead, rather dormant. There might be a little flock of birds that small, small birds, long-tailed tits, tree creepers, a great tit, or a cold tit, moving around. But then you could walk for the next hour and hear or see nothing. This, the, 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 the last week in May, I was sat there in the birch wood on the other side of the river. There was just such a beautiful sound emanating from it. And I was thinking, I didn't know a great deal about birdsong at the time. What, what, what is this? This must be willow warbler song. 
I couldn't think what else it was. Willow warblers are quite hard bird to identify. They're, they're rather plain, look very similar to a chiff chaff. And that was quite a seminal moment for me. I thought that's wonderful. It just, it, it, it expressed for me so much the, the, the spring foliage of the birch wood. Now I'm gonna take you into um, screen sharing to play you something of willow warblers. Here we are in a birch wood in this uh, Spey Valley. One in Sutherland, the scrappy things, but the very natural woodlands up in, in Sutherland. And there's a willow warbler with the fresh green birch foliage. I'm gonna skip that one and play this one. Two songs from a willow warbler. And a raven flying by. So it's not a big show off like a nightingale, but there's something so sweet about that. And what you've got to imagine is, you know, a wood of several acres and maybe up to a dozen males singing away. Um, all slightly different, because notice each of those two deliveries, despite what Bill Oddie says, are slightly different. So you've got a dozen birds singing, overlapping each other with slightly different lines, all very sweet, these descending cascading notes. Um, and I'm playing you that willow warbler because I don't have a, a recording of a full birchwood of willow warblers that does it justice, despite having been uh, rec field recording for 30 years now. Because that, that started me off really thinking about, I've, I've got to get into sound more, um, it's especially going up to the highlands. And sure enough, after a few years, I got into field recording and was completely taken by it. And what, what that reveals is kind of, your memories of experience live in your mind. And so often the, objective, the objectification of the recording doesn't really match it, match the experience. So what, what I got into then, the form of recording, was scenes. I thought of it as communities, having learned about ecology, done, doing this reading about ecology. I thought of them as bird communities, really. And so I'm going to play you what, what is something now, a, 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 a woodland scene from Northumberland that I think exemplifies this. And notice this is the fresh birch foliage again. It's so beautiful in, in, at that time of spring, in the early spring. Okay, you get the idea. I'm going to quit the screen sharing and come back and say hello. Right, okay. Well, getting into recording basically um, put an end to my big walks to a large extent, and it was short walking. I, I uh, self-published a CD, and that got me a commission to produce The Collins Guide to Bird Songs and Calls, two CDs in a book. And so I had to get specific at that point rather than recording communities. And I had to learn about every British species uh, and its songs and calls. A dream job at the time, actually, wonderful. Um, and I put it together as a virtual walk through different habitats, unlike previous announced recordings, if you like. And I, I put a voiceover that identified birds softly afterwards, which, which proved popular. And this 
led me to a I didn't know a great deal about uh, a marsh what marsh warbler but in my research i came across it and um and this description of it uh, by one John Walpole Bond writing in 1933 so just before recording came in so it had to be just uh, songs had to be described in words to convey what they were about he describes the song of the marsh warbler as consisting of a mass of mimicry rattled off some of it in tones low rolling blurred and gurgling some of it again in a key high pitched liquid trilling and very clear the rest in pants sighs wheezes and even nasal phonetics it's a song which at one time somewhat slow subdued labored and even snatchy suddenly flashes into quick smooth sustained effortless rhythm a hurried flow of tune loudly effusive brilliant and intensely passionate even to the verge of delirium wow so i i i that became mythical in my mind i had to hear this and record it um I, which i did in 1997 a of years later and wonderful i recorded nearly an hour got home listened to it and, oh great great but for producing things you need only a minute or two that really encapsulates that song and i couldn't find a minute or two that matched that description and this went on over the next 7 years until i got what was s10 in my collection and i'm going to screen share hopefully successfully again to play you a little snatch from from s10 here's a marsh warbler rather a plain bird but uh, listen to what he sounds like And there you have it, I think. That's it, the verge of delirium for me. He, he achieves it. Fantastic. I don't know what you think, but that bird hits it. And what is interesting about it? Um, Francoise Dowsett met a Belgian lady, studied these birds in the 1970s, and she, uh, she, of 30 individuals, she, she worked out their repertoires of elements and she found around about 200 species imitated between these uh, 30 individuals. Most individuals had around 70 to 80 species, of which half were African and half European. And some of those African birds were, had very specific, very restricted ranges, and people where marsh warblers went in Africa for a time, but these were in a certain area of East Africa, and researchers concentrated there, and it was found that that was their migratory route through East Africa down to Northern Southern Africa. So this bird kind of sings a, a uh, travelogue of the, the, where it goes. And I might think, you know, what do I hear when I listen to a marsh warbler now? Well, the kind of being he is, a, little fiery soul expressing its lust for life in a in a musically sophisticated stream of consciousness like a, a prismatic sonic diffusion of their ancestral path across two continents and it's a small intimate voice that brings out all the wonder of the big wide world to some little damp corner in the north draped in a bridal lace of cow parsley but hey does it really say that or is it just what I hear? Well, it's become now my recording has become very much um, static. I do long recordings.
recordings from uh, one spot and um, I've become the last five years trying to record the the call from uh, an adult female wild golden eagle which is something of a um, chasing a will of a of wisp but what it does do is I spend a lot of time in a certain glen over the last five years and I've listened to everything that goes on in that glen during that period so it's it my life my working life has moved from being uh, a, a, an outright walker up the hills of Scotland through taking shorter sound walks and recording on them to being really quite static in my my approach to recording but it brings in that process it's brought me a great and very rewarding familiarity with all that I hear around me that um, yeah, it's the most rewarding thing in my life. And it's also brought me to meet a whole series of artists that I've enjoyed working with over the last sort of 10 to 20 years, uh, from uh, Harriet McDougall, whose picture is on the wall behind me, um, Marcus Coates, Hannah Tulicki, oh, I don't know, um, Caroline Bergville, and Mike Collier at Sunderland University for the last four years, who I'm now going to hand over to, to tell you about what we've been working on with a great deal of fun in the last four years. Over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks. Um, well, thanks ever so much, uh, Andrew and Babak, for inviting Jeff and I as well. Um, it was really important that Jeff began this because you, you, you might see why I was so keen to work with him because his knowledge and enthusiasm and openness for birdsong uh, uh, has been inspirational, I have to say. Um, we've together, Jeff was, was kind of key to producing this book and a number of the authors uh, are here today, which is great. Um, Jeff also um, pointed this lovely quote out to me, which kind of is at the heart of a lot of what we've been doing, imitating with the mouth, the fluid voices of birds came long before men were able to sing together in melody and please the ear. The relationship between our, our language, our singing, our music, and well, that's for another talk really, is birdsong music, which Jeff's talked about on uh, uh, a number of occasions. A lot of my work is collaborative and I, I work with artists, poets, musicians, composers, natural historians, re, re, natural sound recorders, really important for me because I think it helps to bring us closer to the experience of uh, what it is to be part of a more than human world. Um, I, I met Jeff in uh, 2016 initially. I'd heard, I'd heard a lot about Jeff and was really keen to meet him. Uh, uh, to the new commission I'd received from Cheeseburn Grange in Northumberland. And Jeff explained that he was particularly interested in exploring the way that birds interacted through song in the dawn chorus. And this is a quote from, um, from Jeff that I've included in the book. Um, the established understanding of bird song is rooted in the premise that each singing bird is only or predominantly concerned with intraspecific communication. Yet on listening to the mass of birds singing at dawn, we have intuitively described the phenomenon as a chorus. And a close analysis of the whole auditory scene suggests interspecific structure as well as intraspecific relationships. And this gives rise to this chorus impression rather than random cacophony. The particular dawn chorus that I, that, that, um, I have worked with over the last four years with, with uh, help from Jeff was one that I experienced in mid-May in 2016. And for me, this was important whilst walking through the grounds at Cheeseburn Grange in Northumberland. I think if I'd have stayed just in one in one place, I might have been able to hear all the birds, but it was walking through the grounds that enabled me to fully experience the chorus. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, it started slowly, the My, My Dawn Chorus, between four and five, listening to Robin, Blackbird, Missile Thrush and Wren, and gradually the sound built, a choir of voices singing through the thin morning air. Dunnock, Chiff Chaff, Song Thrush, Blue Tit, Great Tit, Nuthatch, Red Start, Gold Crest, Green Finch, Spotted Flycatcher, and in the background, the soft, repetitive coo -coo 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 of the wood pigeon. And at the height of the chorus, around five to six, I could hear all the voices together 
listening carefully and with the help i have to say of a natural historian friend of mine who was walking with me i could unpick the sound of individual species the liquid sound of the blackbird the operatic wren songs that weave texturally in and out of each other bennett and i and i worked uh, i collaborated with um uh, a musician and composer called Bennett Hogg, along with Jeff. Uh, and Bennett and I considered the complications of representing this experience of the Dawn Chorus, both visually and sonically in a gallery. How to reimagine and not just literally illustrate something of this experience of listening to the Dawn Chorus outside the gallery that we were in. The first thing to do, obviously, was to examine Jeff's sonograms. You can see here, Jeff, do you know which sonogram this is? Yeah. Well, it's got a build up to it from a quiet thing. Uh, mm, difficult one. Is it a chaffinch? Yeah, I think it is Jeff, actually. Yeah. Um, and in our research, Bennett and I came across visualization, uh, visualizations of birdsong in a book um, by W.H. Thorpe. Um, called The Biology of Vocal Communication and Expression. And Bennett noted that um, the rough printed symbols taken from a 1950s oscilloscope, <clears throat> which were illustrated, as you can see here, bore kind of superficial resemblance to handwritten neumes, as you can see on the right-hand side here, a medieval mu uh, form of, of um, musical notation. The word neum is derived from the ancient Greek pneuma, meaning breath, and it's an early musical notation from the Middle Ages. Um, so I started developing um, some notations based on visually examining Jeff's sonograms and playing around with them. And then I extrapolated all the individual songs heard in the Dawn Chorus and created this key for the birds that I heard. And from this key, I copied and pasted each song as a digital score, reimagining the interaction of the various species of my dawn chorus. Um, from just the red start in the darkness of pre-dawn, uh, right the way through to around between 5.36, when all the birds, 16 species I heard were singing together. <clears throat> and then the last two images that I'll show you in a minute where it was thinning out. And you, you, you can see here, um, we, when Jeff and my colleague Alex Charrington, who worked on the digitizations of this with me, we also played the, the song in the studio um, so that we could actually get a real sense of it as well. Um, so throughout our collaboration, Jeff had explained that for him, the key thing about a dawn chorus is what he called the transitional narrative that developed over roughly a two hour period from 3.30 to 5.36. And I'd been working with the, just the dawn chorus itself, the kind of height of the dawn chorus. And I felt I had to do justice to this. And in the next set of slides, uh, I, I, ex I explore this more explicitly, this interaction between birds and their song through time in the chorus. And at the same time, Bennett was working, um, developing a series of notations, which he then built into contemporary notations and then developed um, an, an absolutely beautiful piano piece for it. So this was the sequence that I developed. This is just really a small portion of the four year project that, be, that we've been working on, but this was a key part of it. Uh, and I'd like, um, I'm, I'd like uh, Babak, if you could, to play the music, to play Bennett's music now, and I'll just run through the slides. Um, what you're going to be listening to is, um, uh, and this is the first, this is one of the first times anybody's heard, th heard this. It's the first of three movements from Bennett's piece, Out of the Woods of Thought, the cycle of pieces, just recorded by the concert pianist, Kate Williams. In the past, we've just had um, digital piano uh, when I've shown this work. So this is quite, this was really exciting for me.
<laughs> now, one of the one of the really interesting things about working uh, collaboratively with someone, if you're open minded, and I try to be because that's how I learn, is I end up going in directions that I didn't anticipate going in the first place. So that that set of transitional narratives, I'd not anticipated going in until talking with Jeff. Um, and Jeff also had talked about what he called vignettes within the chorus, groups of birds. Um, Jeff called them communities of song which seemed to represent characteristic phases in the development of the chorus. So I made a, a set of four new paintings. These are about 50 centimeters square. These are actually paintings, not prints. So you can see here, um, vignette one on the left-hand side here, reimagines Blackbird and Robin singing before dawn and so on. And of course, uh, in the book, as, as in my slide, I've got Tim's absolutely gorgeous photographs. Uh, um, we'll talk about his photo photography, I'm sure, during the talk. Um, I've experienced quite a few dawn choruses in my life. And, and, and actually, Steve Westerberg, who's with, who's with us, took me on my first dawn chorus walk. And we shared one or two, what, what, one of which from our house, actually, as I recall. Um, and we, they're dawn chorus walks. They're not just standing still. We used to walk through Strother Hills and into Chopwell Woods. Each chorus, whilst very specific to a time and place, also, I find, carries the memories of all my other dawn choruses, experienced just as once having heard a piece of music for the first time, all subsequent listenings are suffused with a layered memory of that first experience. So here, these, these are two screen prints that I'm working on, which will accompany a special edition of the book. Uh, and on the left hand side, we've got Red Start, Robin and Blackbird, the early, the early birds, if you like, with memories of Greenfinch, Goldfinch and Chiff Chaff experienced in the vibrations of the cool early morning air. So why make this work? Well, if we go back to 1962, it's, shockingly, this was written in 1962 by Rachel Carson in Silent Spring. Strangely silent, uh, where, where she said how the early mornings were becoming strangely silent, where they were once filled with the beauty of bird song. This sudden silencing of the song of birds, this obliteration of the color and beauty and interest they lend to our world have come about swiftly, insidiously and unnoticed by those whose communities are as yet unaffected. As I'm sure Steve may tell us later on, if he, if he joins in the conversation, things are certainly a lot worse than they were in 1962. So my next reference to walking is here. We may indeed be sleepwalking into a disturbingly quiet future, which I think is rather scary. So here's Jeff and my provocation, walking and listening or walking or listening. Wildlife sound recorders and photographers often spend a whole day sitting in just one place waiting for nature to come to them. This is a conversation I have quite regularly with my brother, who is, I said to some of you before, um, regularly sits in one place and waits for nature to come to him. Uh, or on not walking, do the physical rhythms in the body that accompany walking undermine or prescript listening? Or does the loudness of walking drown natural silence? Or perhaps walking in sound is really being in the present within a network of life. Um, I'm a big fan of Richard Maybe. I've got most of his books, and this is a great quote from Nature Cure. Language and imagination have to some extent deadened the quickness of our sensual relationships with the outside world, though that is far from inevitable, and have made us aware of the ways in which we are a different kind of species. But they're also the gateway to understanding our kindredness to the rest of creation to fitting our oddness into the scheme of things, to become awakeners, celebrators, to add our particularly singing to that of the rest of the natural world. OK, thank you very much. Particularly in, in real life, is this heresy to suggest in a community of walkers that actually sitting still uh, might be a way of, of um, engaging with the world? I'll stop. Well, uh, I don't know. Should we? Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. That's uh, uh, a really uh, lovely pair of presentations. Uh, yeah, they, these two gentlemen have uh, laid down the, uh, the challenge. Who's going to have a go at um, pitching one side or the other? Um, if anyone wants to. Uh, um,
I, 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 Andrew, I was going to say, I should have said at the beginning that I also run WALK at the University of Sutherland, which stands for Walking Art, Landscape and Knowledge. So, um, yeah, where do I stand on this? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was going to ask, actually, I was going to ask Tim, your brother, Tim Collier. Yeah. This poor chap, he's been name checked about five times in this presentation. <laughs> uh, and um, he, he obviously sits on his backside and uh, takes amazing photographs. So, Tim, uh, perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about um, how you how you developed your own work and uh, tell me yeah. a little bit about can, how you can, capture can... nature. Yeah, Mike and I, we do have, and um, we'd say discussions, it's not arguments, it's, and there's not a definitive as to the best way, or if, if, if there is indeed a best way, I think, of experiencing the natural world. It, it's very different to different people. Um, but as a photographer, certainly for me, um, it is about sitting, it is about waiting. And in that sitting and waiting, it's more than just waiting for what comes to you. To me, it's something more like a transcendental piece of waiting too, particularly if I'm on my own. Um, you know, and, and, and for example, yesterday I spent five hours in a high just on my own. Uh, no one else came in there at all. And that to me is about the best way of experiencing anything. I couldn't get that through walking. Things are, things are, are happening, uh, relationships are developing between the birds. I'm beginning to see individual birds. I'm beginning over that period to recognize individual birds even, to see how they're behaving. And the things then that come, I think, are only going to come from that waiting, from that being inconspicuous, I think, in the landscape. Um, it's not, as I say, and, and allied to that for me is that sense of I do, I do transcendental meditation anyway. And allied to that is a sense of meditation. You have to enjoy the waiting. You have to enjoy nothing happening. And quite often when, you, when you're working photographically, nothing happens and yet everything is happening so the, the curious dichotomy of nothing and everything is actually going on um, and i walk through landscapes of course i do i walk to places i walk to hives i walk to places to, to you know to get to places um, but i think as jeff said when when i'm doing that i'm not i'm not experiencing intimacy i'm experiencing birds flying away from me or i'm experiencing a little something in a tree that moves and goes and I get the bins up to it and it's gone and then it won't come back and I know it won't come back because you know it's seeing me long before I'm seeing it and so I haven't got a chance to to be that watcher to be that that person who's actually um, communing I think within the natural world so they're very different I was talking to a friend today we were down on the beach and I said we were going to have this, this discussion tonight and we had a little discussion just about the discussion. And he was saying that you're going to get people who are going to be saying, yeah, but through walking through the landscape and the rhythm of the heartbeat and moving through it, they feel that within themselves, they're becoming much more a part of what that landscape is because they're experiencing as they're moving. And actually the rhythm of the heartbeat, the, 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 the exertion that sometimes you're putting into it gives you the respect and a different feeling for that landscape. And I can't, I can't deny that that might happen. But I was sitting and we that were sitting wasn't, on That the wasn't beach. Brendan, was it, Tim? No, no, no. It was Terry, actually, another, another photographer <laughs> so friend. It could, have, it, it could have been me as well. <laughs> it, yeah, it could have been. And, we, and we, were, we were just saying then that, you know, actually, we were just sitting watching the, the sea come in. It's the first time I've seen the scene come in for about six months as well, because we've been locked down. I've not been able to go. So it was a very different experience as well. Um, and that was, again, for me, we just shut up for a bit. And we just sat and we listened and we watched. And we felt, I think both of us felt, part of something and it's that part of something that i can't get walking and that's all i would say it's a different experience i wouldn't say it's better and i wouldn't say it's right or wrong because there isn't but i would say for me to experience that to commune with nature to be to really feel part of it it's it's a sitting and it's a waiting game well, that's interesting. And Ta Tamsin, do you want to say what you've just written in the chat? And we'll, and we'll come back to Bob. I see Bob's waving his hand, but Tamsin, are you there? Yes, hello. Um, Tim, I just wondered, given that most of us, um, most of us and, and the beings around us know things other ways than just seeing, 
whether you think that they know you're there when you're in the hide, even though you said you're inconspicuous. But I wondered if you sense now with this increased sensitivity that you have from being there so long that they do actually know you're there or not. I think I think uh, probably Jeff would concur as well. I think that they're, they're not daft. I mean, you know, you get a bird that lands on a on a post and it'll it'll glance and it'll glance at you for sure. But as long as you're not perceiving to be a threat in any way, then you're OK. But yeah, I think I think there's still an awareness. I think there is a communication and that's quite nice, too. So, you know, you can get a heron that sometimes would be incredibly flighty and off it will go, but it'll stay there. And if you're still, yes, it will. You'll get eye contact with that heron, but it doesn't perceive you as a threat, partly because you're not moving, you're not, you know, doing anything that might disturb that, and also because you're in something. If particularly if it's a built hide, you're in there where it, it knows that that space anyway. That 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 hide, that building is part of its landscape, and most times, hopefully, nothing threatening comes from that because we're all bird watchers in there doing what we should be doing then there's no, there's no perceived threat. So when there's no perceived threat, things just calm down. And, and yeah, and there is that, that communal thing with you, you know. But Bob, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, 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 okay. Um, I find it difficult to take on the challenge as I haven't sat or waited for birdsong. I could address <laughs> by the difference between walking and sound and sitting and sound. I've got one one quali qualification. When I listen to Messien, there's something in his school because he spawned all, all, most of the great late 20th century composers uh, have come from the fact that he listened and was inspired by birdsong. And I certainly experienced Messien as a sitting and hearing experience, as a classical experience. So I think the two, if I if I would I be allowed to compare those two, not having the experience of sitting and literally waiting for, for birdsong itself? So my question that's is, that's... what are our parameters here? Before I um, answer that, could I uh, could I just ask uh, Rob? There's um, we've got somebody here, Harriet Carter, who, whose essay in the book. Uh, and whose PhD is a, is about Messian and birdsong, uh, and and in the interpretation of that visually, I don't know if if Harriet wanted to come in and say because she's actually um, done a residency around where Messian did a lot of his um, listening and note taking. That Harriet, do you, I don't know, am I putting you on the spot or do you? I'm doing my PhD on birdsong and looking at birdsong tree painting, and part of that's looking at musical birdsong. So. Um, as part of my, my work, I went around France where Messian transcribed his, his birds for the Cassard Grosso. Um, and that was very much a walking and waiting exercise. And um, it's, it's kind of, there's, there's been what Tim was saying, particularly from Jeff, in the sense of spending hours now because will not come across the the phrase that's recognizable or the phrase that you expect and the heartbeats of being still and rhythmically in the space uh, with things moving around i found both of those things um and messian i think did too because this the music that he made it, it wasn't just the bird song it was of the landscape too so he kind of included the the rhythms of the nature around him and in, included in that and there's his own presence his own very much talk about in the wind i think you can only really talk about that in music or in in painting or in anything by experiencing that um so i think yeah i, I don't know if that answers any questions or no, actually adds I, anything I just... but um, i i find it a very in, a very interesting topic because i don't know where i sit or, or walk <laughs> or, or sit or walk <laughs> or you sit or walk sit or robert walk. Uh, to, uh, to go back to your to your question i mean i uh, parameters um i suppose the two parameters would be very straightforwardly sitting or walking but i, I think one of the really interesting things is is to me is the difference the the different encounters that you have uh, uh, as an embodied person within the world and um you know, one of the key things around phenomenology and any discussion around that is moving through space. And so walking is kind of a you know a key element of that. And you feel 
the the weather, the air, um, the sounds, the vibrations, whatever on you. I think um, you know very much with Tim actually. You know, this was a provocation, and I'm not, I'm not really a prov provocative person. <laughs> I, I I see both sides of it, but you know, I, I like moving as well. Moving creates its own narrative of sound, but to get intimate, you do have to stop. Um, the other factor is, of course, uh, age. I don't walk so well now myself, <laughs> having had an accident that damaged one knee. Um, and so it has a progress in my life from being a leg being um, a sitting there. I'll not use this, continue using the word arse, but I, you know, so I, I enjoy what I can from both sides. I wasn't sure what Robert meant by what are the parameters. Can I tell you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the parameters are it's, it, it's it, um, the relationship of the experience of sound per se specifically as you're presenting it in relation to birdsong can i broaden those parameters to include sound itself rather than specifically birdsong or my experiment was with with Methian, who's kind of halfway between the two I can certainly talk about, you know, I can discuss the relationship between his music as a sitting experience and say walking in the new forest and listening to birdsong. Are those viable parameters? Those are the two, uh, would that work Understand. within your discussion? I, I think all, yeah. all the work that uh, I've done, and hence, hence the title of the book, which again was gifted to us by Jeff, Songs of Place and Time, indicates that um, it is it, it is place specific, uh, Bob. So you, you know you, you're walking through a place which has a particular ecology, and a particular soundscape, a, a particular um, group of sounds. I mean, Jeff, we were walking yeah, on Sunday. We were walking through the arboretum, and and you were saying there was one particular place which was really quiet, and there was a set of birds that you you kind of um, were familiar with in that space. Yeah, well, I, um, I, I, I mean, I think, I, I, I don't think it's an either or situation, really. It's, it's different experience. I think, um, Mike, you just said yeah. moving through space, yeah? I, I, don't, I don't think I fully have this reason. Mike, Mike, you just said, you know, that you're moving through space, yeah, when you're, when you're walking. Yeah. You, you can, I think, uh, on the other way, you can also say space is moving through you mm. when you're sitting. Mm. So, so you've almost once again, it's this, it's this sort of dual-edged sword. Because yes, you can yeah. move through space and listen, but space can certainly move through you while you're station stationary. Uh, great. Uh, Tim, would you like to, uh, Tim Green, would you like to voice what you wrote in the chat and uh, expand on it? Or do you want to, just people to read what you wrote? I think it's your question's a bit a non question. Uh, for me, it's very much both. I sit for long times taking photographs of birds and of wildlife. And I really like that sense of isolation you have, say, on a rainy day, just sitting still, being mesmerized almost by the sound of the rain going and watching what else is going on around you. And that allows you to focus in from the tiniest insect crawling along the bench in front of you and expand your senses outwards. But also when you walk, there is the annoyance of the sound of your your own movements, but sometimes those movements are not annoying. They're like the sound of, or the joyous sound for me of walking through crisp autumn leaves. It's a gorgeous uh, sound. Uh, but other times my own footsteps along gravel paths have me cursing the people who insist on putting gravel paths around every nature reserve in, in existence. Um, 
But when you're walking around, you're moving through all, you know, you may only be walking for maybe a mile or five miles, but you're walking through all these little different environments and they all have different soundscapes and you approach them and you hear them coming towards you. You hear more of them when you get to them. So you've got the, the small soundscapes of robins and uh, chiff chaffs and other birds going on and maybe like chiff chaffs, you hear them, you know, they're repeating every couple of hundred yards as you're walking along a path. So they're a sort of constant line, if you want, of, of, of sound. But you also go through little phases of, you might have some red wing flying over, or you might have, one of the strongest sounds I associate with is the sounds of jackdaws either coming into roost, telling me it's the end of the day, or approaching a roost from quite a distance away and you suddenly you're going through this gentle approach into that soundscape so i think they both have their their value and i don't think it is one or other and i think most of us would echo to both of those sensations if you're sound recording like if you are doing um photography in essence, when you start to want to record the sound, you are going to have to stop. And, you know, the rules that people like Jeff have passed on or whatever, you're going to have to sit there for at least 20 minutes being absolutely still to get some form of sense of what that space is naturally like. But I often find myself walking just naturally and then stopping and being as si seeing how silent I can be in a space and how long it's going to take for that space to come alive around me. And also the idea that everything flies off from around you is just not true. When you're walking through a space, there are some creatures who come to investigate you and are as interested in you. You get the robins following you, you get the blackbirds seeing what's going on, etc. They're interacting with you. They might start scolding you as you, you, know, you, you get the magpies scolding you as you're going past because they don't want you there. So it, there's a Actually, whole range Tim, of experiences a, out there. That's a really good point. I was uh, in the park the other day, and there was um, there was a crow that had been been fed by one person, and decided that it that 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 was great. So he followed the next person that came along and trotted <laughs> along the path after them. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, that's, that's I mean that's a really that's a really valid point about the interaction even on a walk of that nature. I mean it's interesting. We 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 to kind of play this game about either or i did in the end say okay if you had to decide on one thing and that's always an interesting one you know it's like okay you know for the rest of your life somebody's going to say right you can either sit or you can walk what are you doing and that puts it starkly and i'm sitting <laughs> so you know i mean that's 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 well, um, we've had um, some good stuff, uh, good, good just things say, thrown into the chat. Yeah. So uh, I don't know whether Helen, do you, he, should we, Helen, Quentin and Shane, would you would you each like to voice what you wrote in the chat? I don't know. He, let's start with Helen, although I know she was, she wrote last. But Helen, are you, are you there? Um, I was just saying that um, I, I've come to value walking movement through landscape and environments as a kind of way of of kind of honing your oh, what do you call it your mind in a way it's i think that the act of walking somehow enhances your thought processes so it might be birdsong it might be something else it might be a conversation um, but i find i can think better when i or differently when i walk so um but I also, like lots of other people have said, I also love sitting and listening, particularly to birdsong. That's me. Okay, uh, Quentin, do you want to do, do you want to say anything? Or you don't have to. I'm just suggesting you might like to. <laughs> I have a go. Um, I just think that when you're walking, you're using so many other, so much more is going on. Like you have to stand up straight, you have to kind of control the amount of visual data coming in through your eyes. Your your brain's doing lots of things, lots of processing that it isn't required to do when you're just sitting still and deep listening. And I think it's a different 
a different experience. I wouldn't say one's better than another. I'd just say it's a fundamentally different hearing experience in terms of how how much focus you can put on it. Uh, uh, that's yeah, no, that's I great. That I, think Shane, Shane, I think Shane's nodding in agreement. I was going to suggest if Shane voice, what, what, and then we'll go back to Jeff and Mike, and then maybe move on to uh, Bob Parks again. But Shane, far away, you're, you're also really useful piece you put. Sure. I mean, I, I think I think that what I said was was kind of like what Quentin and Helen were both saying as well. Anyway, um, but I was yeah, I was just making a point that um, there are different ways maybe of observing as well, which is something I suppose a couple of people have also already said. But if I go looking for mushrooms, when I when I look for mushrooms, if you're going to sit still, I mean, you're certainly not going to find very much. Um, you, you have to be walking, and somehow in the process in the process of walking, I've noticed your your sense of smell in particular uh, gets heightened. Um, and you kind of start to pick things out if you forage, if anybody has ever done that uh, much, or even if you're just lucky. I mean, I, I, often I just do it because I'm interested in looking. But and also um, just uh, on the on the counter side of the the walking and sensory, I was thinking about sitting still. And I spent a couple of weeks last year um, painting outdoors um, in the springtime, and noticed that after a little while, the, the, I, no, I noticed detail more in the bird song. It wasn't so much that I seemed to be, like the volume seemed to go up, but it was more, more like I could hear more different birds more pronouncedly. But I wasn't still, I was actually moving quite a bit, and, but I was maybe entering into a state of kind of like observing and, and meditating, something that's kind of meditative. So it was kind of maybe similar to sitting still, but I'm not sure that it was either because I wasn't trying to listen. It just sort of happened as it was going. So maybe I, it's just two observations, but I think it's kind of echoing what, what uh, Quentin and Helen were also saying. Yeah, there's the thing, isn't there? Of, well, in NLP, they call it the reticular activation system, but basically you tune, your mind tunes in. So it all of a sudden, like say you, you, you want to spot red cars, all of a sudden you see them everywhere. And if you're looking for birdsong, all of a sudden you start to really start to, to sort of hear it and then hear the nuances of it whereas you know you might just on another occasion you might just be walking through the space i don't know listening to the wind in the trees and your focus isn't directed in the same way but it's kind of subconscious at a subconscious level it's handy if you're hunting fungus for sure yeah <laughs> But that, I, I presume that is, I mean, I know from when from walking in the savannah in France on the on the high ground there, walking through the the, um, the the time, wild time and things, the smells are amazing. But it it it, it I, I I know I'd smell it if I was lying down, but I smell it a lot more when I'm walking through because you're always brushing against it, aren't you? So that's um, that's a really interesting point, Quentin. There is also something about, uh, I mean, obviously because I run walk. If, if that isn't a, a, a counterintuitive thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but when I, many years ago, when I first set it up, I, I mean, I, I made the, the foolish mistake of, of, of um, presenting at a, a conference and saying, well, of course, walking is, is one of the most egalitarian ways of moving around the world. Almost anyone can do it. Uh, and of course, almost anyone can't do it because there are many people for whom walking is really difficult, and um, there are other ways of looking. And, and then walking as a as a kind of as a as a protest, um, interesting. And walking is kind of quite culturally um, <clears throat> at the moment, anyway. It's quite culture. It can be quite culturally specific. I mean, people in in um, in China or or or. or um, North Africa tend not to walk because they, you know, they'll, they'll walk to get to places, but they don't go walking as a cultural activity. So there's lots of kind of interesting ways of of, of, of approaching this. I think there's an assumption, not that you guys here are making it, but there's an assumption about art and walking or walking being a good thing. I'm actually, um, um, I was really intrigued by um, somebody rang me up and said they, w they were interested in doing a PhD with me because um, they knew that I I did walk and they said they wanted to do it on art and driving. I said, well, that's interesting. And they said, well, what really annoyed them? He, he this guy used to he used to walk loads and then he couldn't walk in the end. He just couldn't do the long distance walking because his body wasn't up to it. 
and then he, he went to a conference and 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 kind of tried to talk about you know, the potential for art and driving to happen and he, he got really got shot down and he looked around and he thought well i bet 90 percent of the people here are driven to this conference and they'll drive to the places as as somebody else said you know they, they'll drive to where they then go walking so i was really intrigued it's turning out to be a fascinating uh, phd actually <laughs> Um, Jeff, I don't know whether you wanted to pitch in anything at this stage, but what I was going to ask um, was there are quite a few people in the room who haven't spoken or haven't written in the chat. We've got about half an hour to go. Uh, before I give Bob Parks another chance to uh, pitch in, um, first, Jeff, do you want to say anything at this stage? Uh, but otherwise, I think we should try to encourage um, No, I others. was interested in Robert. I was interested in Robert raising um, the political dimension because I did have trespass written in large letters on my notes. I ran out of time. Um, the, the contrast between sort of birdsong as commons and the fact that walking in England is so restricted. But no, if if someone else wants to continue the theme as running, please go ahead. Or walking. It, or walking. I, I'd like to ask. I'd, I'd like to ask Stevie actually if you're still there, Stevie, because you've you've done a lot of um, both walking and and sitting in 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 making the music that you make and composing the music and playing it. Well, Mike, as as you know, I I kind of um, what I do, I like to do both. I'm very lucky where I do my bird stuff. Um, in the Ardennes, it's in a particular garden, but that garden has a huge view. So what I love doing is at the same time, but on consecutive days, I will sit still <clears throat> and record or write the notation or play my fiddle and make those sound maps. So I'm walking with the sound because that helps me be able to write it down. So I am walking, but I'm walking in order to listen. And then a I can like, understand. A bit like Wordsworth, a bit like Wordsworth composing as he was walking. Well, I think it's also, you know how Jeff talks about this narrative that I find really, really useful to focus on. So I'm I'm developing my narrative for understanding what, what the Dawn Chorus is doing in, in that last piece by making a map of how the birds are moving and coming towards me and going away. Um, <clears throat> and that feels like walking with my ears. And then I love to do the same thing when I'm actually walking. What I learn most from birds is how they use space. It's 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 the greatest kind of surround sound spatial thing that you can have, I think, as a composer. And I I find, of course, when I'm walking, I'm kind of drawing a line through that. So it's another experience, but. I'm not getting that wonderful spatial kind of feeling from it, but but the comparison is is great, and uh, and also as as lots of us have been saying, that kind of physical effort, I um, mean it's pretty hilly where I am, um, <clears throat> is 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 also you feel part of it. But the other thing I notice is that it's not really walking, but when I play, if I'm playing blackbird songs, which is all I do at the moment. Um, then the then the birds, as one of the other speakers was saying, they the garden fills with blackbirds. I mean, they 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 come uh, only if I play blackbird songs, but but um, then I feel they're walking with me, although I'm still. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah, but it's all a bit of, yeah. And but it sounds like you, I who, walk when you say playing. Blackbird song. You're not talking playing recordings. I'm going to turn my video off because I, I can't hear. When you say playing blackbird song, you mean playing them playing songs on your fiddle rather than playing recordings of blackbird song. Playing them on my fiddle and I'm also sometimes playing the Ah, oh, We've lost you, Stevie. Um, I did. Uh, I, uh, you'll probably kill me for this, but I did want to ask um, Steve Westerberg as well. Sorry, the network's but, gone. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll just ask you another question, Stevie, and then come back if you if you get through. But um, Steve, I know you 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 wrote in the book very practically about a lot of the things you do um, 
out in the landscape when when you're ringing putting up the mist nets uh when you're rec you know when you're doing data recording and things like that so either standing still or walking is probably quite a different practical experience for you yeah, yeah i mean yes and yeah i think i'm just always listening so i don't think it really meant to, for me i think now it doesn't make any difference yeah whether you what, whether, what you mean I'm, whether you're sitting or moving you're just constantly you're listening. moving or even uh, I just the other day I just noticed just talking to somebody, and uh, I was just listening to birdsong in the background as well as listening to that. Yeah. But you see, like Jeff, you, your skills have been honed over a lifetime, haven't they? So you, you are always listening. I mean, I've been out for a walk with both of you, and you, you, you're you're always noticing the birdsong that's around and understanding what's there as well. Yeah, but, but yes, yeah, so I mean, I yeah, I'm just doing part of work, and I just do survey work all the time so it's just uh, yeah just part of what i am now yeah i mean the first the first time i met you we did a dawn well not the, quite the first time but one of the first times you led a dawn chorus walk so that was probably about a five mile walk and maybe three five mile walk and then we also did a walk up the um derwent valley from sea to source again mostly listening to birds but through so you get that progression through that of the progression of birds through space through geography yeah that yeah, that was really great wasn't it just going from mm -hmm. the lowland you know from sea level to yeah probably well from the metro yeah. center actually wasn't it yeah, so <laughs> an urban area to sort of uh, yeah sort of a driven grouse more yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. Big range of what, species. What, what, why on earth didn't you follow the river down <laughs> Down, down the flares. And water. Why, why did you walk against gravity? Did you? Would you have because, heard something different if you'd uh, uh, walked with the river? Because it was over a series of weekends through the spring. So the spring, we were following the spring. If we'd done it the other way around, uh, it would have been still winter on the higher ground. Uh, so yeah, we were following the birds as they were moving yeah up the valley. Because yeah, I'm going to say Jeff has, uh, Jeff has worked on the till, and Jeff, are you are, are you recording the till from source to sea or from sea to source? What what are you doing? Oh, he's slowly. I've just you know just uh, done a lot of recording, but I would like to ask Stephen um, to what extent your listening to birdsong is a geographical mapping of territory. Oh yeah, that's what I'm just doing all the time. I think yeah. I mean, yeah, today at work, I, yeah, that's what I, during the spring, mapping where birds are so we can sort of monitor how populations change. So, yeah, I, you know, at school, I used to do common bird census and mapped birds, just absolutely loved it. Uh, yeah, and yeah. even going back so to, I guess it's, yeah. the walking you do is probably stop start to a certain extent short stops and then walk short stop and... yeah w yes yeah i think i was just talking to a colleague today about how it's a very different year it's very dry um it has been cold birds are birds birds aren't so active so we, yeah we had this conversation about a wet she normally just walks and records what she sees as she walks and i was saying that the survey today and you know one of the first ones this year it was very different and you had to stop and scan and most of the the, the wading birds we were rec particularly recording uh, i only saw because i scanned because they were just sitting quietly and not displaying and i think that's yeah. something to do with the cold northerly yeah. winds we've had and the dry weather yeah yeah but anyway, that's, yeah i'm i'm f i'm finding that with record is uh, it's hard work because they're not singing continuously they're just singing short short uh, snatches you know so I, I just kept i've been up doing ring oozles up uh, on, on the cheviot and uh, you're just getting short periods and then they go off again you know yeah um okay so uh linda has written something linda uh, would, you, would you like to uh, speak up and talk about that and then we'll come back to bob because i know bob's got a cracker on there um, yeah, no, so it just occurred to me that um, I don't know whether it's something about mirror neurons or something, but that when I'm walking, I tend to see birds that are also in movement. And when I'm still, 
I'll m more likely be able to see the ones that uh, have come to rest momentarily. Um, so, so there's something like almost like micro and macro about that. So I can look more closely at a at a bird that's still briefly um, than when I'm walking and and and, the, and have a sense of being with the birds as they are also flying. Um, I, I tend to do both. If I'm um, I, I, I'm a I'm a writer, but it, I do feel that. Um, listening is a very important part of my practice, but um, uh, I tend to n definitely need to do both. And um, the walking is about covering ground. And, and I, I, did, I like that thing that Stevie mentioned about the narrative that she picked up on what Jeff had said, so that there was something about the, I suppose, the journey making, the the circuit, the the atlas um, of, of where whatever the whatever place you're in, um, but uh, the sitting when I sit when when the weather conditions are are okay so that I can actually sit and write, sit and be and observe and write. Um, that's really important for assimilating. And again, it seems to a sort of a deeper connection seems to be made. Um, but I can't quite assimilate and digest at while I'm walking. I don't. It's just I'm, you know, unable to multitask. I'm less and less interested in multitasking. I'm all for monotasking these days. Um, so, so, so the sitting is. Um, it's, easy, it's usually, of course, to write when you're sitting down and being still than when you're walking. I can't do what Wordsworth did and keep it in my head at the same time as walking because that sort of interrupts with my being there. It, it you know, I, it sort of it splits my attention. Um, That's really interesting, Linda, and it kind of picks up on what Quentin was saying earlier on. I, I think that's a really interesting point what you're both touching on, which is that that different sense of self in relation to one act or the other, not one not being better or worse than the other, but being different and being aware of how of, of what that difference is. Mm. Um, I think that's really interesting. Mm. Yeah. And complementary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's sort of both and it's yeah, you wouldn't really want to be without either. Um, I, I've been really mean. Oh, oh, sorry, Mike. Oh, do you go on? Go ahead, Mike. No, I was just going to ask uh, um, Jane, um, who's been very quiet in the background there, but who I know does both meditate and walks and uses sound in her work. And it's a mixture of stillness and movement, actually. So uh, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Jane. For me, I feel that um, I, I think I'm newer to this than everybody else but I think that walking um, and listening is what well that's what I've been doing but then I suppose when I've been installing my sculptures in the trees then I am quiet and either sitting or standing quietly and still and so yeah maybe I can hear the sounds more then and when I'm doing the recording of the videos and the sound, I, th I, I like both actually. Yeah. Because I, I heard what somebody else said earlier was when you're walking, it gives you time to think, and I find that really um, relaxing. Um, and so then when you're looking at the sculpture that's installed in the trees then I find that quite meditative because you're focusing on the sculpture um, whilst listening to the sound yeah so that's what I think thank you Robert that's really okay? interesting thank you Jane okay. yeah Robert that's really interesting have we got Mike, time can I can I to... just add something very quickly Mike yeah yeah uh, uh, Andrews, um, that's all right. 
I, I, I just saying that like with Jeff, myself, we've got an intermediary piece of equipment as well that, you know, sometimes you could say is a barrier um, to experiencing. I know this is a kind of another debate to some degree, but we're not, in a sense, we're not just sitting. We're sitting with a purpose. We're sitting to get something. With and that's technology. a bit different. And that's just, yeah, and that's just an, another, another aspect, I think. I mean, for me, the camera intensifies the looking um, rather than some people will say, oh, but doesn't it get in the way of the experience? And it doesn't, but that's a completely other debate. But it's interesting about just sitting with nothing at all or sitting with a camera or sitting with a recorder. And, and that's, they're, they're different things. Yeah. Tim, it's, do you mean because of the intention behind the sitting? It's almost like waiting with intent. Yes, I, yeah, I think that is it. I think that is it. Yes, I think it is. You know, you, 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 there's an expectation of getting something, I think, in that way. So there is, there is an expectation that maybe five or six hours in a hide will bring you something. Um, yeah, and and, and that, that's quite interesting, I think. <clears throat> and can I, I think of a um, difference there between recording and photography as well? Because I, you know, as a rec as a sound recordist, some people do some sound recordists use mics on their shoulders or on their hats and record themselves walking. I couldn't really do that. It's it's not my. Actually, I do it occasionally, but not not for bird or wildlife stuff. I do that more for cultural um, landscapes. Um, but it, so it, 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 I have to stop if I'm going to record. Which I suppose you do photography. Uh, what am I trying to say? I really enjoy going for the camera, but if I'm going, if I'm recording, then I only walk to get to a spot where I'm going to record. Hmm. If that makes hmm. any sense. Yeah, well, I, in, a, in a way, I'm, I'm I'm slightly the opposite in that way, in a sense that the, I don't walk with the camera; I tend to stop with the camera, and I walk to get to yeah, somewhere, yeah. then and then and then work, you know, with with the camera. In, in in that one so there's a this it's it's yeah. slightly different um but it's it's a very interesting it, one yeah. I, Tim, I, I i use when i'm on a recording expedition i use the camera for sort of therapy time off so it's a, it's a way of i go for a little walk with the camera and it helps because i'm I'm sort of looking for photos a little bit, and it, it and it actually engages me with looking more closely at things. So it might yeah. be just bits of foliage yeah. or little, little, you know, people get really sick of my photos of mountains and my photos of leaves and things like that. But <laughs> it, 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 I, I enjoy it. It's a th it's mm. a th therapeutic thing in the mm. way that um, my my recording isn't because my recording is more like what you're you're, you're talking about with your mm. photography mm. i mean it's interesting because i i'll still go on walks with birding friends with with just a small camera and binoculars sometimes and i'll take the deliberate choice that i'm not photographing and then it is a walk and then i am experiencing something completely different but it's not my mm. prime you know reason if somebody said well what do you want to do walk with a group of people who are birding or sit on your own it will be sit on your own, but it doesn't. I don't deny the other one because the other one does bring. Well, actually, it brings more birds in the end when you're walking as well. You know, because you're because you, you're travelling through different landscapes. You know, you do a five mile walk from the river up to a, a a valley or something. You're going to see more than you are if you just stay in your one place down on the river. But if you stay in the wrong place of the river, you're likely to see more relative behavioural things than you are. Well, I Tim, that that. Get, I, I don't, have we got time, Andrew, just to talk about birdness and um, that what what Bob was talking yeah, about? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is really but... interesting. And actually, do you know, I could spend the whole I could have spent the whole of this discussion talking about this, Bob, because it, it's what really interests me as well. Do birds have a sense of themselves? How do they see themselves in relation to us, et cetera, et cetera? I love the where you end here. I'd love to imagine what birds make of us. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, make of us in 
movement and stationary and our relative inability to see migrate and fly the birds allowed to assert themselves in sound space with COVID-19 and where might that develop do you want to say a little bit have we got time for for Bob said yeah about we've that? got we've got about 12 so minutes left okay about okay yeah minutes left. That, yeah okay. let me add a little bit it, an example of uh, humanity or whatever you want to call it people and birds uh, I heard the first cuckoo of spring about a week ago in the New Forest, and a barking dog obliterated the sound space. I visualized the cuckoo hiding behind the branches and the, tr uh, and, the and, and the leaves in the trees. So it gave me that ability, um, uh, you know, and the DNA. I, I heard a program about the, uh, the, the it, uh, it, it's all programmed this migratory skill and it's something to do with the, the DNA, DNA in their eyes and that it, it's, a, it's a, 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 a sophisticated, just way beyond our consciousness. So I just really, but the question is, what can we, we learn from birds, not rather than what can yeah, absolutely. they teach us? And I think we, we're just on the cusp of this. We're just, yeah. you know, we, you know we, we're so dominant and assertive and egoistic that, 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 that they might have a, you know, a, a life well, as well, and they might be Bob, trying what, to communicate to us. What, one, one of the things that I wrote in, in um, I can't remember if it's an introduction or in my chapter, but uh, I mean, there's been such a lot of work done in the lab on birds, horrifically and horribly, and okay, we probably learned quite a bit, but I do, I have this thing about what, 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 what else might we have, we, we could probably have learned so much more by doing what you're suggesting, by observing, by engaging, by looking at behaviour, but you know, and we, we might have found that so much more, not just about them, but probably about ourselves at the same time, instead of dissecting them in the lab and, you know, finding out what the, what that is in their little brains and things. But um, and do birds have a sense of self? Oh, absolutely. You think about the cuckoo, by the way, is really interesting because a migration. It was I'm listening to David Attenborough the other day. I mean, Jeff, you'll know this, but um, the 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 young cuckoo uh, migrates to um, Africa, not following the parent, but somehow migrates to this to the right place without having anyone to uh, any uh, parent to guide it. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't sounds... ask me. It's magnetite in the brain um, oh. to guide them, but what actually creates the desire to go there, or, or, or the, you know, there must be some kind of um, software map in their brain that 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 uh, homes in on a certain place. I, 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 yeah, I don't know. One one salutary thought is that we, we wouldn't have any air flight if, if it weren't for Leonardo da Vinci noticing birds in flight. <laughs> I mean, a whole part of our our, our, our um, civilization is based on our observation of birds and totally uh, unattributed. Or, or our destruction of the planet through um, air pollution. <laughs> Homes that we, we, we talk about their trees where they where they live. Alan, hello, Alan. And are you still there? We haven't met for thirty-four. Yes, 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 I'm here, Jeff. It's good to it's good to be here. What a great cafe. Um. Yeah. To where where are you speaking from? Firstly, I I live in southeast London, which is not that great for bird song, but uh, we have some blackbirds. We have too many parakeets, I'm afraid. Uh, so, uh, like I said in my well, I, chat, I, I, I rather like parakeets, actually. Oh dear, I, I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm a complete snob. I only really love the blackbird, the, the singer. No, what I like about the parakeets, I mean, what is like when I went to. There's all this soft little, um, they're like jays. It's almost like some song they do amongst each other. And I actually, this, and they just blend into the trees. You can hardly see them being green and amongst green foliage. The sounds they make are almost like branches squeaking and what have you. And I, and I thought, you know, their their vocalization, the two modes, the loud stuff out there, and then this soft thing of the flock keeping in contact with each other, it's it's very much part of what helps them be so, so, so successful. 
Hello, hello, Jeff. I thought I'd, it's gone dark on me, hasn't it? I ought to put a light on. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've just been trying to tease out in my mind. Uh, I've, I'm extremely connected uh, with the natural world. It's kind of everything that informs all the art making that I, that I do. I'm a sculptor. Um, and it's incredibly important to me to both walk and to sit. Um, and I get a tremendous amount out of both. And I was trying to think of what are the differences. And I've, I don't know if this is, this is going anywhere or not, but I feel that when you sit still, and because you really do become part of the environment around you. I, I, I agreed a lot with what Tim was saying earlier about the experience of sitting still and, and all the wildlife coming to you and moving around you. And some of my greatest experiences observing all sorts of wildlife have come when, when I have just been absolutely still. And I found that at that moment, what's happening is I'm losing myself. I no longer exist. Uh, it's all about what's around me. And I've become completely insignificant and I kind of forget myself actually, because it's just the fantastic experience of absorbing the sensory input of, of what's going on around you, the, the, the complete acceptance of the wildlife that no longer the birds aren't running away. I've had them foraging and behaving completely naturally with me sitting still. And I've seen deer displaying amazing natural behavior that I couldn't possibly have seen if they were aware I was there. But then when you start moving, that's also a fantastically exciting sensory experience. Um, but it becomes about, perhaps about, the, about that, the, the sensor's effect on you. And I mean, walking on rock for some reason for me is very important. Uh, the, 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 the feel of rock under my feet, um, maybe it's, it's simply that very direct connection with, with the land, uh, I don't know. Um, the feel of the wind and all the elements and rain. And I mean, I went for a walk in the, this winter on the most ridiculous day when it was like Siberia. And I actually screamed out with laughter, a woman on her own walking across the, <laughs> the, the, the millfield plain, screaming with laughter because of the, uh, just the battering with the elements. And that, and it's that again, you know, you just feel this is fantastic. Yeah. So part of what's around me and going on. But, but that's actually, that actually my physical experience perhaps rather than the other one which is that meditative experience of you kind of losing yourself in in the, i don't know i don't know if any of that makes sense but that's what i was trying to, to, yeah. to look at both valuable both really valuable ways of enjoying and hearing the world but different in an inward almost an inward and an outward looking perspective perhaps i don't know Okay, so thank you, Claire. That's really great because we're <laughs> no, 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 because uh, we we always give we always give our main guests the last word, and uh, and we're sort of you know right on the uh, on the on the final course. There is a book to Cele buy. Celebrate, and you, you're right, Anne, uh, uh, Andrew. There is a book to to buy, um, and uh, you can get it on um, the Corner House website or on Amazon. Or uh, DM me if, if you follow me on either Instagram or, and, uh, or or Facebook, and I can arrange to have one sent out to you. So it, it yes, it's available, and it's it's quite handsome actually. Uh, there have been some fantastic contributors to it. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled with it, and um, it's lovely to see some of them here. Um, but I, I have to say that uh, Jeff was a kind of you know Jeff, Jeff was really the the inspiration for all of this I could also I just want to thank Babak and uh, Andrew for this as well it's it's really it's really great of you um to put this together and and Babak for all the work behind the scenes as well you got us through it <laughs> and it, it, it was it, it, yeah it, I mean it, it, it was a prov provocation but I think we knew that it was really a, a platform for a discussion um and I think it's really interesting actually you know I think the either or yes but I think, you know, Quentin and Linda and people like that, I think you, you threw up some really pertinent points, Bob, uh, in relation to how we see ourselves as we engage with the world and how we engage with the world and how we experience sound through that as well. And, and Jeff, do you want to have a final word? Because um, Mike's, yeah, anything more to... Well, I would just say thanks to everyone who came along, really. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's very heartwarming particularly after this last sort of winter when I've seen nobody 
much, you know. Yeah. I don't do an awful lot of these these meetings, so it's, uh, yeah, it's nice to get to see people. Thank you. Um, but while we're still here, still here, I actually have a small question for Mike. Um, I was wondering to what extent uh, the musical notation that you use for the Brit song is different from uh, regular musical notation, if uh, it is. It's, it's abstract. It's completely different. It, it's a kind of double away from what but but Bennett then got into the really interesting uh, way of it coming that coming from Jeff's sonograms then abstracting that into um pneumatic notation and then of course Bennett worked the other way to get it back into uh musical notation um so Bennett is kind of twice removed really and it, it, I think it's fascinating what he's ended up with yeah, I mean what we did then, do um, is pay what, oh. what we did do is pay attention to the sound uh, you, you have noticed from that slide, and Jeff's been hugely helpful on this. When, when we were, as we were, work, as I was working on those notations with Jeff sometimes and and, and um, Alex, we had the sound playing through the speakers as well. So if I say it, that's probably not strictly true to say it's completely abstract. Um, yeah, does that make any sense, uh, Babak? Or yeah, uh, well, a little bit, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a musician, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nor am I. Um, but, well, I play the guitar uh, well, very badly. <laughs> uh, well, then Stevie, we I, it's a pity we didn't get into this because St Stevie came to exactly the same conclusion as me using pneumatic notation. But actually, you're a proper musician, Stevie. <laughs> Are you gone now? And, and uh, yeah. uh, as a follow-up question to this, we heard what I thought was a gorgeous piano piece, right? Um, and um, it, it reminds me a little bit of atonal music. It reminds me a little bit of Philip Glass specifically. Um, so I want to buy the album. Where do I get the album? Okay, uh, if you just, uh, I'll, 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 let, I'll let you know, Babak, because it will be available soon um, as a download. Uh, and I'm going to slip it into the books, actually, when we sell them as well. But I'll, 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 I'll let you have a copy, no problem at all. It is really, really beautiful, I have to say. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Much appreciated. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm also going to extend my thanks. Uh, I thought it was really pleasant and very nice and a little bit different from what we have had in the past. So that's also fantastic. Um, all right, then, uh, Andrew, do you want to? All right. OK, so, folks, that, that's all, folks. And thank you very much for supporting Walk, Listen, Create and uh, coming to the cafe. And don't forget, if you've got work that you're working on, or pieces that you'd like that you've made before and you'd like to uh, publicize you're all now registered on the site you can use the site and please we'd love you to do so and once again big thanks to to Mike and Jeff